Can objects truly grant us the satisfaction we deeply crave? Is there a point when acquisition transforms from necessity to indulgence or even obsession? As I stand in the midst of a sprawling mall, the gleaming displays, enticing fragrances, and the murmur of countless shoppers envelop me. Each one seems on a quest, a quest seemingly not so different from the gold rushes of the past. Yet, instead of gold, today's nuggets of desire are smart devices, clothing, and an ever-evolving myriad of goods. Historically, humans traded and bartered based on necessities. Gradually, as civilizations advanced, markets became more than just a place to get essentials. They transformed into grand bazaars, where luxuries from distant lands captivated the imagination. Marco Polo, in his legendary journey, spoke of the rich markets of the East, and this fascination with acquiring exotic luxuries paved the way for the modern consumerist world. But the real thrust into the world of consumerism as we know it came in the 20th century. Consider the dazzling allure of the Roaring Twenties in America. Jazz echoed in the streets, flappers danced the Charleston, and everyone seemed to want the latest conveniences that innovation and industry offered. Great figures like Henry Ford revolutionized manufacturing with the assembly line, making products more accessible and affordable. Simultaneously, the advent of advertising as a science in itself ensured that consumers felt not just the want, but the need for products. The era gave birth to a newfound freedom, the freedom to buy. I can almost feel the excitement of that time, the intoxicating aroma of newness, the texture of freshly stitched garments, the shimmering allure of newly minted products. It was a world discovering the power of purchase. Yet beneath this sheen, there began a subtle shift in the human psyche. A shift from acquiring what one needs to acquiring what one desires. As the sun casts its golden hue over the sprawling city outside my window, I reflect upon how deeply intertwined our sense of happiness is with material acquisition. The buildings around me, like towering giants, are clad with billboards announcing the latest and the best. The soft glow of my phone screen displays an advertisement for the newest smartwatch. In this moment, I feel the pulsating heart of our modern era, an era where buying is not just an act but an experience, a promise of a better, happier self. Is this the epitome of progress? Or have we replaced the pursuit of happiness with the pursuit of possession? Have you ever felt the thrill of buying something new? That palpable heartbeat as you unwrap a new gadget, or the soft rustle of a shirt's fabric as it's lifted from the box? I have. Yet this pleasure, this ephemeral high, often diminishes as swiftly as it comes. But why? Why does the joy of acquisition fade? And why do we find ourselves yearning for the next purchase? There's a misconception deeply embedded in the fabric of our modern society, that every new acquisition is a step closer to fulfillment. We are bombarded with tales of individuals showcasing their lives filled with luxury, perpetuating a narrative that more is better. But the question remains, does owning more truly equate to happiness? A few years ago, after much contemplation, I acquired the latest smartphone in the market. The feeling was exhilarating. Its sleek design, the pristine screen, and the promise of better connectivity seemed like an invitation to a better life. Yet, a year later, another model emerged, boasting newer features and greater efficiencies. My once latest phone felt obsolete. This cyclical nature of consumerism made me wonder, was I buying the product, or was I being sold the illusion of contentment? Often, the world of advertising paints a picture of the perfect buy. This image suggests that one purchase can be transformative, propelling an individual from their current life into one filled with admiration, success, and above all, happiness. It's fascinating how products are anthropomorphized, given qualities that promise not just function, but emotion. Take, for instance, car advertisements. A car isn't sold merely as a vehicle, it is portrayed as a symbol of freedom, adventure, or prestige. But once the initial charm wears off, the reality sets in, and the quest for the next perfect buy begins. Data supports this narrative. A 2020 study by the Consumer Research Institute highlighted that while initial satisfaction levels spike after a significant purchase, 
they tend to plateau or even decrease over a span of three months. Interestingly, this trend is more pronounced in societies with higher levels of consumer advertising. This suggests not just an individual, but a systemic challenge. Consumerism doesn't just tap into our desire to own, it creates a perpetual loop of want. However, it's essential to not oversimplify the narrative. For many, purchasing isn't just about chasing happiness, but also about conforming to societal standards. How many times have we bought something just because it's the in thing, or because we believe it projects a particular image of success? In our digital age, the role of social media cannot be ignored. Platforms where influencers showcase their latest acquisitions have become the modern-day showrooms for brands. Here, a life of opulence and luxury is continuously broadcasted, making viewers feel that their lives are comparatively mundane or lacking. The curated reality of these platforms, where every post, every photo, and every story seems to scream, look what I have, feeds into the cycle of desire and discontent. The constant bombardment of such images often blurs the distinction between genuine aspiration and mere imitation. At its core, consumerism often taps into our basic psychological needs. The need to belong, to be recognized, and to feel accomplished. Brands, aware of these intrinsic human desires, design campaigns that promise not just products, but experiences and emotions. A perfume isn't just a fragrance, it's an aura of allure. A watch isn't just an instrument of time, it's a statement of legacy. The trap here is that such promises often lead to an external validation-seeking behavior, making personal self-worth contingent upon possessions. During my college years, I observed a classmate donning a pair of high-end shoes. She later confided that she skipped meals for weeks to afford them. The shoes weren't just shoes to her, they were symbols, an attempt to fit into a particular societal mold. But at what cost? Here, consumerism wasn't a path to happiness, but a societal pressure, an imposed yardstick of success. Consumerism's challenges go beyond the individual. Environmentally, our penchant for more has escalated waste production. The World Environmental Bureau reported in 2022 that global waste from consumer goods increased by 70% in the past two decades. Herein lies another paradox. While we seek happiness through buying, our buying patterns contribute to the deterioration of the planet, our collective home and source of sustenance. Are we trapped? Have we, in our quest for tangible happiness, painted ourselves into a corner of perpetual dissatisfaction and environmental degradation? So where do we go from here? Is there a middle path, a way to indulge in the comforts of modern consumerism without succumbing to its vices? As I sit on a park bench, the gentle rustle of leaves and the distant laughter of children playing remind me of life's simple pleasures. Isn't it ironic that amidst the relentless clamor of consumerism, nature offers a sanctuary, a reminder of joys that don't come with a price tag? The way forward isn't necessarily about renunciation, but reflection. It's about discerning between needs and wants, about understanding the impermanence of materialistic joy. As I once read, happiness is an inside job. Perhaps then, the solution lies in cultivating an inner reservoir of contentment, independent of external acquisitions. I recall a trip to a remote village. The children there played with simple handmade toys, their laughter, genuine and infectious, was a testament to the fact that happiness can be derived from the most uncomplicated sources. Their world was not devoid of consumer goods, but these items did not dominate their source of joy. The idea isn't to shun consumerism entirely, but to engage with it mindfully. Being informed consumers, understanding the environmental and societal implications of our purchases, and most importantly, regularly checking in with ourselves, can help bridge the chasm between acquisition and contentment. Incorporating sustainable practices offers a tangible solution. Choosing products with longer lifespans, supporting local businesses, and endorsing sustainable brands can make a significant difference. But beyond these practices, we must also foster a cultural shift, a culture that celebrates experiences over possessions, values over vanity, there's a beautiful symbolism in the act of planting a tree. 
It begins as a mere sapling, vulnerable and dependent. With time and care, it grows, not just benefiting its nurturer, but the world at large. Similarly, cultivating a mindset of conscious consumerism is an investment, an investment in personal well-being and the planet's health. As the sun begins its descent, painting the sky with hues of amber and mauve, I am reminded of life's cyclical nature. Just as day gives way to night, only to rise again, our consumerist tendencies can evolve. We can move from indiscriminate consumption to a phase of enlightened conscious buying. In the end, maybe it's not about buying happiness, but understanding that true happiness, like the most radiant sunsets, is not confined to material possessions. Perhaps, it's about experiencing the world in its entirety, with all its contrasts and comparisons.